Rebecca started her professorship here at Harvard in 2017. And since then, she's been in the office next to me. And as a colleague of hers, I can genuinely say that I really admire and, and look up to Rebecca as one of the most prolific younger scientists who is active today. The list of her publications, the different topics she studies is just really, really am amazing. And just as one example of that, um, you're about to hear a, a talk about the formation history of the Earth and the Moon. Um, but I'd like to point out that this is really just one fraction of, of Rebecca's very extensive research program. And she's also involved heavily in understanding the formation of Mars and the interior of the, of the deep Earth and the core. So I, I remember, the first time I remember meeting Rebecca was at a conference back in 2014. We're about to, both of us were about to finish our PhDs at that point. Um, but after some years later, and we became friends, we chatted a lot more with each other, we, we realized that's not actually the first time we must have met. So it turns out that both of our high schools had quiz bowl teams. Now, if, you, um, if you're not familiar with Quiz Bowl, it's basically Jeopardy for, for maybe somewhat nerdy high school kids. Right? And we had these little buzzers, and we answered questions about trivia and see who can answer the fastest. Um, as it turns out, in 2005, when we were both seniors in high school, our, our teams played each other at the, at the Quiz Bowl tournament finals in, in Chicago. Um, so that, that's the first time we met. but. Fortunately, probably for a friendship, neither of us could remember who won. <laughs> so, you know, neither of us has that bragging right over the other person. Um, but well, I'm happy to say that despite um, the fact we started our acquaintance with this, this rivalry and who is the, the bigger geek, um, I'm very privileged to have Rebecca today as, as a very close friend and colleague. Rebecca? Thank you so much for that introduction, Roger, and thank all of you for coming tonight. Um, so this evening, I'm going to be telling you a bit about how the Earth and the Moon formed. Uh, I'm going to start by telling you sort of what the state of the scientific community's thinking is about how the Earth and Moon formed, what we think we know about how this happened. Uh, and then later in the talk, I'm going to tell you a bit about what we don't understand, sort of what the big open questions are about how the Moon formed. Uh, and I'll tell you a bit about the research that my group and others in our community are doing to try and resolve these issues. So to start out, uh, why do we study Earth and Moon formation? Um, fundamentally, we're interested in better understanding the planet we live on. The current state of the Earth today is a product of how it formed and evolved over time. So if we better understand the formation, we can better understand its current state. We're also interested in how planets form in general. Uh, the Earth and the Moon are the, the best sort of planetary bodies to study because they're the bodies that we have the most samples from. Um, but we hope that by learning a bit about how the Earth and Moon formed, we learn about principles that we can apply to other planets, both in our solar system and in systems around other stars. And finally, uh, we're all interested in understanding why the Earth is so unique, why it has liquid water, why it's the only planet with life on it. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, a lot about uh, the Earth's current state dates back to how it formed. So how do we go about studying the formation of the Earth and Moon? Uh, a lot of the results I'm going to be showing you today are computer simulations. There are very complex calculations uh, that we run on supercomputers. Uh, that sort of recreate planet formation and moon formation. Uh, the other main way that we, we study the Earth and the moon uh, is by geochemistry, that is, uh, looking at rocks from the Earth and moon and seeing what they're made of. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that data later. Uh, so to start out, how did the Earth form? Uh, really, the question of how the Earth formed is a question of how the solar system formed. Uh, because the entire solar system was forming uh, simultaneously. So we started out with the solar nebula. The solar nebula was a cloud of gas, uh, and in this cloud of gas, the sun began to form. And as the sun formed, uh, some of this gas collapsed into a disk 
around the sun. Um, this disk was very hot, everything was, was vaporized in it, but then as it cooled, uh, the first solid particles in our solar system began to condense out. We formed little dust grains. Uh, closer to the sun, these dust grains were mostly rock, as well as some iron metal. Further out, uh, the materials that were condensing were more like ice, water ice, uh, methane, ammonia. And these little grains of dust, as they orbited the sun, uh, collided with one another and stuck together to form gradually larger bodies. Uh, when I say dust grains, what I mean uh, are little particles about the width of a human hair. And they sort of collided with one another to form gradually larger bodies until we'd formed uh, things that I would call pebbles, or sort of millimeter to centimeter sized uh, little discrete objects. Uh, the pebbles then collided with other pebbles and formed larger and larger bodies. We call them planetesimals. So these are, are objects that are maybe tens to hundreds of kilometers across. Uh, as an interesting side note, this process of how you get from pebbles to planetesimals uh, is, is something that is very poorly understood. Um, it's difficult to collide things that are pebble-sized without breaking apart. Uh, getting them to stick together turns out to be really hard. Uh, so we don't understand the exact physics of how that happened, but somehow we formed uh, planetesimals. Um, as time went on, uh, we formed uh, what we call protoplanets in the inner part of the solar system. So these are uh, objects that are about the size of the moon today, uh, up through maybe the size of Mars. Uh, meanwhile, in the outer solar system, the outer planets had already formed. They formed first. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune uh, formed very early on, uh, while in the inner solar system, we still had these uh, bodies that are sort of the building blocks of the planets. And finally, the last stage uh, of solar system formation was the formation of these inner planets. Uh, we also call them the terrestrial planets, meaning Earth-like, uh, and that's because they all have more or less the same internal structure. They're all made of a metallic iron core surrounded by a rocky mantle and a rocky crust on top. So this process of how you get from sort of planetesimals and protoplanets uh, into the inner planets that we see today uh, is a, a subject of active research. Um, and in particular, we can run computer simulations of this process. So these are uh, uh, simulations that start out with a few thousand of these smaller bodies orbiting the sun. Uh, so I'm gonna show you uh, a movie of what one of these simulations looks like. Um, so here is uh, the sun here at zero. And then uh, moving to the right here is increasing distance away from the sun. This is in, in astronomical units, or AU. Uh, so one AU is where the Earth is today. That's its current distance from the sun. Uh, we also include uh, Jupiter, which is this big uh, black circle here, and Saturn, which is off the scale of the image. Um, the vertical axis here is the eccentricity of each body's orbit. So that's a measure of how round its orbit is. So a value of zero means that the body is going around the sun in a perfect circle, and a high value means that its orbit is really elliptical or oval-shaped. And you can think of this as a, a measure of the chance of collision. So if a body's orbiting the sun, uh, in a really sort of oval-shaped orbit, it's gonna cross the orbits of a bunch of other things, and it's gonna get sort of swept up and collide with them. Um, so the, these are all the uh, initial bodies, and they're color-coded based on where they start out, so you can visualize the mixing that happens. And when I push go, uh, this clock in the upper right is gonna count forward in time in millions of years. So the first thing that happens is you get things start to go on really elliptical orbits due to interactions with Jupiter. And then in the inner solar system, we start to form increasingly larger bodies that are going to eventually turn into planets. And you can see that they start out uh, mostly red and orange. They're made of material near where they started. Uh, but as they collide with things, as time goes on, they start to collide with things from further out and they become more blue with time. Um, 
And this is really important because it's the material from further away from the sun that's more rich in water uh, and other things that we know are important for life on Earth. So these kinds of simulations uh, give us information about how much of this material is delivered to Earth and sort of when it might have been delivered. Uh, these kinds of simulations are usually run for 200 million years of solar system time, which is the equivalent of a few months of computation on a supercomputer. So these are, are very numerically intensive calculations. And we generally form between three and five planets in the inner solar system. Uh, so in a recent study, we ran 100 of these kinds of simulations, and we found that 73 of them formed some planet that looked like the Earth in terms of its distance from the sun and its size. Um, so this lets us say that the Earth uh, is something that's very likely to form if you started with the solar system that started out like ours did. And so by looking at all of these simulations that we've run, uh, we can get information about several different things. Uh, for example, how the Earth grew. Uh, so this figure on the left shows uh, the size of the Earth, so a value of one is the Earth's current size today, and how the size changed uh, as a function of time. And you can see uh, there's a lot of different possible curves the Earth might have taken. That's because there's a really high degree of randomness uh, in this sort of solar system formation process. Um, so some, sometimes the Earth seems to form in maybe 30 million years, other times it takes 150 million years. And so this is sort of the, the range of uncertainty we have in the amount of time it took to form the Earth. Uh, these simulations also give us information about the origins of the Earth's building blocks, where the material came from in the solar system, which you saw as the Earth changed color in the previous video. Uh, another thing to, to point out is that uh, we include Jupiter and Saturn in these calculations because it turns out what's happening uh, in the inner solar system is really sensitive to what Jupiter and Saturn are doing. Uh, and this is uh, an area that's uh, sort of still unresolved. Um, it's thought that Jupiter and Saturn might have been in a different part of the solar system than they are now, uh, back when the solar system first formed. Uh, and it turns out where they were and whether or not they might have moved around uh, really influences how the planets form in the inner solar system. Uh, so this is, this is an area of, of active research. Um, okay, so that's a, a brief introduction to how the Earth formed. Uh, now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about how the moon formed. Um, so the Earth is not the only planet with a moon. A lot of planets have moons. Um, and there are a number of different ways that we know that moons in general can form. Uh, one way that they can form is that they can form at the same time as the planet that they're orbiting from the same kind of material that the planet is made out of. Uh, and one example of this, uh, this is how we think the moons of Jupiter and Saturn formed. Uh, so here I'm showing Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, which are moons of Saturn that we think formed in this way. Um, and the way you can tell if a moon formed like this uh, is that if, if this is how the moon formed, the moon and the planet tend to be made of about the same kind of stuff. Um, so uh, can this explain how our moon formed? Uh, probably not. Um, and that's because if you were to look inside the Earth, uh, you would see that it has a big metallic core. It's mostly made of iron. Uh, and this accounts for about a third of the Earth. Uh, the moon does not have a big core like this. Uh, we think it has a small core, but it's only about 1% of the moon. So the moon and the Earth look really different on the inside, uh, so we don't think they formed from the same material at the same time. Uh, another way that we know that moons can form is that they can be captured. Uh, so if you have a body like an asteroid, uh, that gets too close to a planet, sometimes it gets sort of stuck in that planet's gravity and caught orbiting that planet. Uh, and one example of this, uh, this is how we think the two largest moons of Mars formed, Phobos and Deimos. Uh, one sort of smoking gun to tell if a moon formed this way, uh, which you can see by looking at Phobos and Deimos here, uh, is that uh, often these moons are irregularly shaped. They're not very round. 
Um, and so that, that doesn't uh, really mesh with the moon, which is, which is very round. Um, and uh, the reason why we think that some moons are round and some aren't is uh, it's a difference of whether or not they ever melted. Uh, so if a body melts, uh, all the rock on its surface is molten, and it sort of smooths out any topography it might have had. Uh, so there's, there's the moon's roundness is an indication that it melted at some point. Uh, and also being captured does not explain the fact that this moon has this very tiny core, um, which is sort of unusual. So we don't think that our moon was captured. Uh, which brings us to the third way that moons can form, which is in a giant impact. Uh, and this is how we think that the Earth's moon formed. Uh, so this image is an artist's conception of what this giant impact might have looked like. Uh, we think that the Earth was almost done growing at the time, about 90% of its current size, uh, when it was hit with an object about the size of Mars. Uh, the collision uh, caused a bunch of material to be knocked off of the Earth, uh, and this material then got stuck in orbit around the Earth and formed a moon. Uh, a giant impact uh, has a lot of energy in it. it. It has enough energy to not only melt rock, but to vaporize rock. Um, so that would explain why the moon is so round. Uh, it also can explain why the moon uh, is mostly rocky, why it has such a small core, uh, because in a giant impact, uh, the moon would be formed from material knocked off of the surface. Uh, this also does a good job of explaining the moon's orbit uh, and its composition. The moon is, is missing a lot of materials that tend to evaporate easily. Um, so that's, that's how uh, we've come to the conclusion that our moon most likely formed in a giant impact. Uh, and we can run computer simulations of this process to learn more about how it might have happened. Um, so in this movie, uh, this green body is the Earth, uh, and this orange body is the thing that's going to hit the Earth to make the moon, the impactor. Uh, in planetary science, uh, we really like to name things, uh, and so this body has been given a name. Uh, it's called Theia, uh, even though it's hypothetical. So you see Theia hitting the Earth, um, they sort of spiral into each other, and you get a second collision. And you can see the material just being, being ripped apart and caught up in orbit around the Earth. And so uh, the material that's now orbiting the Earth, uh, with time, it's going to sort of collide with one another and stick together and form larger and larger body until that body becomes the moon. Uh, and this process is very analogous to the process of forming planets from small bodies orbiting the sun. In this case, we're forming a moon from small bodies orbiting the Earth. So uh, all this uh, sort of debris out here is going to eventually coalesce into the moon. Um, so one thing we can tell from running a simulation like this uh, is if you, if you look at the, the final Earth, you see it's, it's mostly green. It's mostly made of the Earth material. But if you look at the stuff out here orbiting the Earth that's going to go into making the moon, uh, it's mostly orange. It's mostly material from Theia. Um, and so if this is, in fact, how the moon formed, uh, we can make a prediction that the Earth and the Moon should be chemically different from each other. They're made of different material from two different bodies. Um, so we can test this. And we can say, is this really how the Moon formed uh, by assessing the similarity between the Earth and the Moon? Uh, so how do we do that? Um, first, we have to understand what the Earth and the Moon are made of. Uh, well, like all matter, they're made up of atoms of different elements, uh, like you see here on the periodic table. And so one way that you can compare the Earth and the Moon is by asking how much of each element do we have in the Earth and the Moon. So for example, what percentage of the Earth and Moon is made of oxygen or silicon or gold or sodium or any other element? Uh, but there's actually a far more precise way that we can make this comparison. Uh, and that is by using something called isotopes. Um, so as an example, uh, we're going to think about oxygen first. Uh, and to understand what an isotope is, we have to look inside of an oxygen atom. 
So if you could look inside of an oxygen atom, this is what you would see. Uh, it consists of a nucleus in the middle that's made up of protons and neutrons, and then outside there's some electrons. So each oxygen atom contains eight protons, eight electrons, and eight neutrons. At least that's your typical oxygen atom. But every once in a while, you find an oxygen atom that has nine neutrons in it. It's still oxygen, it just has one extra neutron. It's a little bit heavier. Uh, and sometimes you even find an oxygen atom with 10 neutrons in it. And so uh, these are the three different isotopes of oxygen. So an isotope is just a different variety of an element uh, that has a different number of neutrons, like a different flavor of oxygen. So oxygen, for example, has three main isotopes that we talk about with, with eight, nine, and 10 neutrons. And on the Earth, 99.76% of all oxygen atoms that you'll encounter are oxygen 16. They have eight neutrons in them. But 0.04% of all oxygen atoms uh, have nine neutrons, they're oxygen 17, and 0.2% have 10 neutrons, they're oxygen 18. And it turns out that the exact number of each of these different isotopes of oxygen you have is unique to every body in the solar system. So it's kind of like a fingerprint. Uh, if, and this can be measured by very uh, fancy pieces of equipment called mass spectrometers. Uh, if you give someone a rock from some other planet, they can measure how much of these different oxygen isotopes it has in it and tell you what what planet that came from, because it's, it's unique to every planet. Uh, so it's a really good fingerprint, uh, because no two bodies in the solar system have the same oxygen isotope fingerprint, except, it turns out, the Earth and the Moon. Uh, and this is not only true for oxygen, uh, it's true for other elements as well. Um, so this is really surprising, uh, because we saw in this simulation of moon formation, uh, when the Earth in green was hit by Theia and orange, we ended up making the Earth out of mostly Earth material, it's pretty green, and this moon material out here uh, is mostly orange, it's mostly material from Theia. And I just told you that no two bodies have the same oxygen isotope fingerprint. We don't expect that the Earth and Theia had the same ones. Uh, so how can we explain the fact that the Earth and the moon turned out with the same isotope fingerprint? Uh, so this is one of the big, uh, open questions in planetary science. Um, and I'm not gonna be able to give you an answer at the end of the talk tonight, but I'm gonna tell you what some of the hypotheses are to explain this and uh, what we can do to try and narrow down uh, how we can, can explain this problem. Um, so there's three main hypotheses that people have put forth to explain this. Uh, the first is that maybe right after this giant collision, the Earth and this debris around the Earth were able to exchange material with each other, or at least oxygen. So even though the Earth is made of Earth material and the Moon is made of Theia material, maybe while this material was out here orbiting the Earth, they had time to sort of mix with each other and erase the differences between them. Uh, one of the criticisms people have of this hypothesis is that we don't actually know if that happens. Uh, and it might depend on exactly how the impact happened that formed the moon. Uh, so another hypothesis that people have put forward more recently uh, is that maybe we're wrong about the way the moon forming impact happens. Uh, it has always been thought that this was a collision with a sort of Mars size impactor hitting, hitting something that was 90% the size of the Earth. Uh, but in 2012, uh, two papers came out that suggested different ways that this impact might have happened. Uh, and so one of them is the fast spinning Earth model. So this is very similar to the scenario I showed you earlier. Uh, the difference is that in this one, the Earth is spinning around really, really fast. And you can't really see that in the movie because it's a circle. Um, but you'll see a difference uh, when the collision happens. So now uh, Theia just basically gets absorbed into the Earth, uh, and both the Earth and the material around the Earth, they're both mostly green. So it's, both, it's mostly Earth material going into making the Earth and the Moon. Uh, so that might explain why the Earth and the Moon look so similar. 
Uh, the other idea that people have proposed uh, is that maybe instead of a, a small impactor, maybe the Earth and Theia were exactly the same size. There were just two half-Earths that ran into each other. Uh, and it turns out when this kind of collision happens, uh, the two bodies do a much better job of mixing with each other. Um, so what you'll see here is that both Earth and the material out here that goes into making the moon is a mix of the green and the orange, the earth and the thea material. Um, but it's not exactly a, a slam dunk that one of these can explain moon formation uh, because they both require very specific types of collisions. The, the earth and thea have to be just the right sizes compared to each other. They have to hit each other at just the right speed and just the right angle. Uh, so it's possible that they could explain how the moon formed but we don't really know how likely it is that this could have happened. Uh, and so the third hypothesis uh, that people have put forward uh, is that maybe the Earth and Theia coincidentally had the same isotope fingerprint. That is, the orange material and the green material was all the same. Uh, so I told you earlier that, that as far as we know now, uh, pretty much everybody in the solar system has a different isotope fingerprint. Um, so the problem with this hypothesis is that it sort of requires a coincidence uh, that the Earth and Thea happened to be the only two bodies that looked the same and they ran into each other. Um, so what do we do with this? Uh, we've got this, this problem. We can't explain why the Earth and the Moon look so similar with our conventional view of how the Moon forms. Uh, we've got these three hypotheses. How do we evaluate which one is right? Uh, so the strategy uh, that my research group and others have taken is to try and test how likely each of these ideas is uh, to see if we can establish oh, that one of these was really likely to have happened or really unlikely to have happened. Uh, and so uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be focusing on this third hypothesis. So maybe the Earth and Thea coincidentally have the same isotope fingerprint. Okay, a little bit more about isotopes first. Um, isotopes can be either stable or unstable. Stable isotopes are isotopes that do not change with time. Uh, unstable isotopes uh, are also called radioactive isotopes. So that's, that's an isotope that's going to turn into something else if you give it enough time. Um, so oxygen isotopes are an example of stable isotopes. Um, and we think that the reason why different bodies have different oxygen isotopes, we think that reflects um, variation in oxygen isotopes from when the solar system first formed. So the distance from the sun reflects something about the oxygen isotopes that were present. So if two bodies were to have the same oxygen isotope fingerprint, that would mean that they were made of material from the same part of the solar system. Well, that's something that we can test uh, because we have simulations like this one. So we can ask, what is the likelihood that Earth and Thea have the same source location? So if you uh, watch this movie again, you'll see there's a, there's a planet starting to form around 1 AU, and that's our Earth analog for this particular simulation. And you'll see it get hit by a bunch of things and change color every time it gets hit. So what we do is after we run one of these simulations, we look and see what was the last large thing to hit the Earth. And we call that Thea. And we look and see basically what color was Thea and what color was the Earth when Thea hit it. And that tells us if they're made of the same material. So uh, people have done this. And they've, they've sort of asked the question, what is the likelihood that Earth and Thea have the same source location or isotope fingerprint? Uh, two groups have tried to do this using oxygen isotopes. Uh, the first group found a probability of 20 to 40 percent. The second group found a probability of 5 to 8 percent. Um, so that's not very satisfying. Uh, papers have been written to try and explain why these are so different. Um, it has to do, we think, with how the different studies defined what Earth and Thea are in their simulations. Uh, but when these results came out, um, that was pretty encouraging. Uh, 20 to 40 percent, that's not so bad. Uh, you know, it's not 100 percent, but it's, it's certainly plausible that this could have happened. Uh, 
Uh, my group also did some work looking at uh, isotopes of an element molybdenum, uh, which are a different kind of stable isotope. Uh, and we found it's even easier to match the molybdenum isotope fingerprint of the Earth and Moon. It happens more than 60% of the time. So based on looking at these kinds of stable isotopes, uh, it seems that it's possible that the Earth and Thea, and thus the Moon, coincidentally have the same stable isotope fingerprint. Uh, so just to remind you, we're trying to understand why the Earth and the Moon look so chemically similar. We have these three hypotheses. We're testing this third one, uh, that maybe the Earth and Theia, the Moon-forming impactor, have the same isotopes. And when we look at stable isotopes like oxygen, the answer seems to be maybe. Uh, we can't rule it out, that's for sure. Um, so that's what we get from stable isotopes. Uh, now we're going to look at an unstable isotope. Um, there's an element called hafnium, uh, which is right here on the periodic table, uh, and it has uh, an isotope, 182 hafnium, that turns into 182 tungsten. Uh, hafnium, you might not have heard of, it's a pretty obscure element. Tungsten uh, is best known for its use in light bulb filaments. And so this process of turning 182 hafnium into 182 tungsten happens with a half-life of nine million years. So that means if you started out with 100 182 hafnium atoms and you waited 9 million years, 50 of them will have turned into 182 tungsten and 50 of them will still be hafnium. And if you wait another 9 million years of those 50, 25 will turn into tungsten and 25 will still be hafnium. Um, 9 million years might sound like a long time, but it's very short compared to the age of the solar system, uh, which is about 4.57 billion years. Um, so all of the 182 hafnium that was around when the solar system formed has turned into 182 tungsten. You can't find any 182 hafnium around. Uh, but we can see the signature of its decay by looking at the isotopes of tungsten. Um, planet formation happened in the first tens to maybe 100 million years. Now remember back to the, the video I showed earlier of planet formation, uh, we were running that for sort of 200 million year kind of time scales. Uh, so this means that we had 182 hafnium turning into 182 tungsten while planets were forming. And we can use these isotopes to learn something about how fast the planets might have formed. Uh, and to do that, we're going to take advantage of the fact that hafnium and tungsten are very different elements and they have very different behavior. So hafnium is what we call a lithophile element. Lithophile literally means rock-loving. Uh, so when a planet is forming and it's separating into a metallic core and a rocky mantle, the hafnium atoms all go into the mantle. Meanwhile, tungsten is what we call siderophile, which literally means iron-loving. Uh, so when the planet forms, most of the tungsten atoms go into the core. Not quite all, but, but most of them. Uh, and so we can use the isotopes of hafnium and tungsten to learn about the timing of core formation, uh, and thus sort of the timing of planet formation more generally. Uh, I'm going to uh, show you a cartoon to illustrate this process. Um, so this is a little slice of a planet before it's formed a core. Uh, and it's very early on in solar system history, so it contains a bunch of atoms of 182 hafnium in brown. And first, we're going to consider the case of very late core formation. So the planet sits around for a long time, still hasn't formed a core, and all of this 182 hafnium has turned into 182 tungsten. Uh, finally, uh, much later on, the planet separates into a core and a mantle. Tungsten, remember, is siderophile. It follows the metal. Uh, so most of these tungsten atoms go into the core, and you're left with just a tiny bit in the mantle. Um, so then we can consider the other sort of extreme case of very early core formation. OK, so again, we start out uh, with a body before it's formed a mantle and a core that's full of 182 hafnium. The core forms very early, while the hafnium is still hafnium. Uh, and hafnium, remember, is lithophile. It goes where the rocks are. So all the hafnium goes into the planet's mantle. And then time passes, 
the 182 hafnium turns into 182 tungsten. Uh, and now in this case, you end up with a whole bunch of 182 tungsten in the planet's mantle. Um, so what we can do is we can take a sample from a planet's mantle and measure the amount of 182 tungsten atoms in the mantle relative to, say, the total amount of tungsten. Uh, and that tells us something about the timing of core formation. Uh, it also is related to sort of the, the detailed mechanisms of how the core formed, the physics of it, which I'm not going to get into today. Um, okay, so the tungsten isotope fingerprint of a body tells you something about the timing and mechanisms of core formation. Uh, interestingly, the Earth and the Moon also have the same tungsten isotope fingerprint. Uh, this is really useful information because now the tungsten isotope fingerprint is telling you something really different than the oxygen isotope fingerprint, which, remember, uh, was telling us where the building blocks of the planet came from. Um, okay, so to remind you, we're, we're trying to explain why the Earth and the Moon uh, have the same isotope fingerprint, even though the Earth we expect to be made of Earth material and the Moon to be made of Theia material. We have these three hypotheses. We're looking at this third one, that maybe Earth and Theia coincidentally have the same isotope fingerprint. When we looked at the stable isotopes like oxygen, the answer we got was maybe. Uh, it's possible that the Earth and Theia were made of material from the exact same part of the solar system, and thus coincidentally had the same oxygen isotope fingerprint. But what about tungsten? Uh, tungsten is telling us uh, about core formation. So what is the likelihood that the cores of Earth and Theia formed at the same time and in the same way? Um, so this is something that we can calculate. Um, so to, to understand this, uh, you have to understand a little bit about how core formation happens in planets. Uh, core formation is happening while the planet is growing. Uh, so the planet is experiencing these large impacts on its surface uh, and these, these big impacts have a lot of energy, and so they cause a lot of melting on the planet's surface, uh, generating what we call a magma ocean. Uh, so the entire surface of the planet is just covered in magma, just molten rock. Uh, and every time uh, there's an impact, the metal in that impactor uh, will undergo chemical reactions with this magma at very high pressures and temperatures deep inside the planet. Uh, and so we can use our understanding of these kinds of chemical reactions uh, to model the evolution of planetary chemistry. Uh, and so uh, the first piece of information we need to do this is simulations of planet formation, uh, like the one I showed you earlier, because uh, we need to know how the size of the planet would have changed as a function of time. Uh, so here I'm showing you uh, three different Earths that formed in three different simulations, just as an example. You can see the, the size of the Earth, uh, where one is the Earth's current mass, uh, changing with time in these three different cases. And then every time the Earth uh, is hit by something, uh, it undergoes uh, an episode of core formation where there's a reaction between the metal and the magma, and that changes the composition of the mantle and core. And we can calculate this uh, for all of the major and important elements uh, in the Earth. Uh, for example, here I'm showing uh, tungsten. This is uh, not just the 182 tungsten. It's all isotopes of tungsten. Uh, and then we can also, with the same kind of calculation, calculate how many of those tungsten atoms were 182 tungsten. So this is a measure uh, of how the isotopes changed with time as the planets grew. Uh, so with these kinds of calculations, uh, we can calculate what the final composition for Earth and Theia were in terms of both their elements and their isotopes, like 182 tungsten. And then at the end of this kind of calculation, uh, you take a sort of a piece of Theia that's moon-sized, and it undergoes one last core formation uh, to form the moon. OK, so this tungsten isotope fingerprint telling us something about the timing of core formation uh, so what is the likelihood that the Earth and the Moon have the same tungsten isotope fingerprint? Uh, so we did these calculations, uh, and it turns out that the probability of that happening is less than 5%. Uh, 
So that's not great. Uh, generally, when we, we try to find a hypothesis to explain something, we want it to work more than 5% of the time. Um, okay, so let's come back to this. So, so the, the problem here is that we formed an Earth out of Earth material, a Moon out of Theta material, but somehow they look chemically the same. Uh, we have these three hypotheses, and today we're just looking at this third one. The stable isotopes like oxygen uh, say that maybe this hypothesis is correct, but when we look at radioactive isotopes, like in the hafnium tungsten system, the answer turns out to be probably not. Uh, so based on this, we think we can exclude this hypothesis as explaining how the Earth and Moon formed. And so this means either uh, that there was some chemical exchange between the Earth and this debris orbiting the Earth uh, right after the Moon forming impact, that erased the isotope differences between them, or it means that we're wrong about how the moon forming collision happened, and it's one of these newer ideas of how this collision worked. Okay, in conclusion, uh, today I, I showed you how the, the Earth and the other inner planets in the solar system, uh, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, formed from the collisions of smaller bodies uh, in the first tens to maybe 100 million years of solar system history. Uh, the moon, we think, formed from a giant impact, uh, although the details of this are still debated. Uh, and that's because um, all of the simulations we run of this impact show us that the moon should be made mostly of the impact, or Theia. Uh, and so why do the Earth and the moon have the same isotope fingerprint? Um, there's three main hypotheses that have been put forward to explain this, uh, that maybe after the collision, the Earth and the debris exchanged material. Uh, maybe the collision happened in a different way than we think it did, or maybe the Earth and Theia coincidentally had the same isotope fingerprint. Uh, and what we've shown is that this third one is a very unlikely coincidence. And I'd like to just end uh, by acknowledging my collaborator on this work, Francis Nimmo, uh, Dave O'Brien, also uh, Miki Nakajima and Sean Raymond for providing the movies and funding from NASA. Thanks.